here on the podcast with Mr. Will Spencer from the Winston Cup Museum and Special Events Center. Will, thanks for taking some time. It's 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 pretty cool. I've actually never been here, and first driving in, and you got a lot of the old style logos and signs up, and the big mural up on the sidewall as you go to park of just kind of all the memories from a lot of my childhood in the 90s and stuff I watched before in the 80s. It's it, it's uh, it's almost like a time machine of certain, uh, a, a little bit walking in here just to kind of see. It's crazy to see how far things have come. And off the top, I appreciate you uh, even having any of this so that people can even see about it because people born in the 2000s have no real honest clue about uh, kind of where the sport kind of come from, at least in the in the Winston era of the '70s. So, even just to me, off the top, it's it's pretty cool just to see how far the sport really has come. Well, thank you for having me, Tyler. Um, the museum is a really neat place. It uh, it was kind of in 2001 where Reynolds was with the Master Settlement Agreement. Um, they got out of the Winston Racing Series, and we looked after JKS, which is the parent company or the owner of the museum, um, we we did the, looked after 97 Winston Racing Series tracks. Plus we did NHRA, the Winston Drag Racing and the Winston Cup. So we, JKS supported the series, um, those three different series over a 25 year period. I started JKS in 83, 84 and um, the first piece that I did for Reynolds was the press conference at the Reynolds building for the Winston and Jerry Long put up a million dollars for everybody to win and we we had a little podium sign and a banner and um, Jerry announced what they were going to do and what it was going to be called the Winston so it it was one of those pieces that when it started in the in the museum basically chronicalizes from 1971 to 2003 the 33 years that Reynolds was part of the sport or the series sponsor. Um, in 2003 I was tasked like I was in two for drag racing and one for the, the, the racing series was to, to shut it down, uh, end it big, figure out how we could do what had been done over that 33 year period. So there were a couple of things that happened. Uh, it happened really fast. We developed a logo, it was called the Victory Lap Tour. And it represented the 18, they were 18, I'll get that right, 18 champions over the 33 years. So we created cars that basically uh, represented in the period, they were current day cars, they were 2002 or threes, the cars that went to the racetracks that um, were the throwback paint scheme, which were, was really cool with the Victory Lap logo. So. We have, in the museum, in the victory lane, we have Matt Kenza's victory lap car in yeah. the victory lane because he was the last champion. Um, but what I, what I knew from what we had done over that 25 plus years was that as the cars changed and the show cars changed, well, the cars changed, a lot of cars became show cars, the X race cars. Um, when they became changed, or it became outdated to where it was, you couldn't upgrade that car to be a current car. Um, I used to tell everybody, Bill Soper, which runs the museum, um, take it to the warehouse, one day I'm gonna do a museum. Yeah. So it was kind of a... You kind of saw this coming. It was kind of, <laughs> it was kind of a joke, but that was over a 25 year period. Like the car here in the lobby is the first um, Winston show car. It was built by Junior Johnson up in Ingle Hollow. It runs. Um, it's a statement to the commitment to the sport that Reynolds had in, in, in 1971. Um, for me, 1971, my first race was at Rockingham with a friend of mine's dad who worked at Reynolds and he had tickets. And um, I can still remember Cale Yarborough and Richard Petty going at it, you know, for the win. But through time with the museum, with Reynolds getting out and pretty much the master settlement change in their business model. 2003 was a big year to be able to um, document everything that was 
through that 33 year period and be able to, to, to get a lot of the items that Reynolds had. I mean, the, the perpetual trophies here, which there's a sister to it that NASCAR has, it's in a case and it used to be in the lobby at the Reynolds building. There are lots of pictures here that were in sports marketing. Um, the victory lap series of pictures that were done. Um, we did one for the driver and, and, and Reynolds had one. They're, they're all actually here, except for Darrell Waltrips is missing. He's still on the victory lap tour. Oh, okay. We don't know what happened to him. So the, the mural here depicts who was where and when it's 250 feet long and it starts in 1971 and goes to 2003. So like my good friend Richard Childress is in there in the 80s, but he kind of gets pulled into the, the picture. He, you know, he was, he was never a champion, but he's been a hell of a car owner. Yeah. And so it kind of chronicalizes that period where he was and the transition to Dale to drive his car and where Dale ended up and then Junior came into the sport. So. Um, it took about six months. All of these pictures that are in the mural are original pictures that were taken by Reynolds through that 33 years. It's amazing just when I actually looked at just a piece of the research, just how involved Winston was. It wasn't just paying for naming rights and go have fun with it. It was, I mean, it was a very serious involvement, even down to just looking at the Winston and you know what you know the, the All Star race, and just how involved they really were. I mean, they really it seemed like they put everything they had into not just growing the sport, but I mean, obviously to help make themselves look good. It just seemed like a lot more of a commitment than maybe you would think if you didn't look at like the details. For what we did <clears throat> for Winston Racing Series, Winston Drag, and in, in, in the Cup Series. Um, they didn't spare any expense. Um, they built suites. They supplied the tracks with all the red and white paint. Um, the signage, um, we call it, it was an agreement with the tracks that for the Cup Series. It was called EPP is what it was, but it was basically the signage rights at everywhere from Rockingham to Wilkesboro to Darlington to Talladega. Um, they did the, built the victory lanes. Um, they were very supportive of, you know, revamping racetracks, uh, the smaller tracks, you know, if it was South Boston or Caraway, their commitment, um, they put their name on it, they were only going to do it one way and that was right. Yeah. And, and, and that was a great piece for, for JKS, but a greater piece that I was able to take all of that history and put it here in the museum. Yeah. They spent a, they spent a billion dollars. Wow. Over 33 years in yeah. motorsports. That's a lot of, they sure a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. You can fund a lot yeah. with that for sure. They, they, you know, when they couldn't advertise on TV anymore, they, you know, that was the direction that they took. And that was, um, you know, it was very creative. You had Ralph Seagraves, which was the first person that went out and made, made the deals with the tracks. You know, the, the deal was that, um, Junior Johnson came to Reynolds and made a proposal, and basically from the proposal they said, well, Junior, we'll help you find a sponsor, but we don't want to sponsor you, we want to sponsor the series. And a lot bigger than just sponsoring one right. car. And then, you know, they started, and then T. Wayne Robertson, which um, became head of sports marketing, um, drove, actually drove the show car, and there's a picture of him with two Miss Winstons. I about to say that yeah. uh, that is a heck of a picture. T. Yeah. Wayne was a he was a lucky man that day. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we have Marilyn Greens. That's her original uh, outfit that she wore. Um, she has an advertising agency, um, Green Ford. Uh, she's married to Mr. Uh, Mr. Green that owns the Ford stores and stuff in Greensboro. Oh, okay, that's so cool. It's, you know, it's 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 funny because. As long as, as Winston was in the sport and was, you know, cup racing, I know people nowadays that are, you know, my age, I'm 31, that will still a lot of times when referring to NASCAR, refer to it as Winston Cup. Like, right. it, it, it still has not, even though they got out of it in 03, there was so much of that, of like our childhoods wrapped up in that. And I mean, you know, obviously, you're a little older than me. So <laughs> a lot of your adulthood that was just wrapped up in that, that it still hasn't 
broken, and I think a lot of that is just because of how good a time it was. I mean, I know NASCAR NASCAR had been around since 49, but that period with Winston from 71 to 03 was, you know, right. I mean, it was probably the best era there was. But well, definitely the most popular. Well, you've got Bowman Gray Stadium, and um, believe it or not, Bowman Gray Stadium is one of my oldest customers, Dale Penless and I, back when they used to give away a little Ford Fiesta. And so about 84, 85, I was doing stuff for Bowman Gray. Um, and Jeff Bird, um, that became, that worked at Sports Market and was a manager and then became the director for, for Bristol Motor Speedway. And he, he passed away about 10 years ago. It's God, time flies. But he, I, I went to meet with him and I had been doing, for the creative services at Reynolds, I had been doing work for them and that was pretty much how the press conference came for the Winston. And I went to him with a stack of four by six pictures and said, hey, these are all the things that I'm doing for JKS. And he looked through about, two thir about a third of them and says, well, you can do anything that we need. And it started that relationship. And it, um, I'm very proud of the, the time that I got to do. We still do work for Reynolds, and Reynolds is a great company. And things, you know, with everything, marketing changes. I mean, we're marketing now for the millennial. We're not marketing for the... Um, um, the old blue-collar male yeah, that maybe you used to yeah, in the 80s. So and we're not... Yeah, it's kind of like... Um, I still try to figure out what... Gen I'm, what generation I am, or if I'm a baby boomer, <laughs> I think I think the baby boomers are behind me a little bit. There you go. I think the all the things that Reynolds did um, with NASCAR at the tracks with the series sponsorship, they they also help find sponsors for the teams. If it you know uh, Bud Moore, um, you know Richard Childers Piedmont, uh, Maxwell House Coffee, Budweiser. Reynolds was an integral part of helping the teams find Fortune 500 companies to be sponsors. Um, who, who can talk to them better than someone that is one of them? Right. So, like, Goody's Headache Powder um, is today, I would say, the longest-running supporting sponsor of NASCAR that I know of. Um, actually, they, uh, you know, the Goodies Headache Award. How can you forget that? And, yep. and you mentioned about the cup. Well, there were lots of discussions when it went from Winston to Nextel and then Nextel to Sprint and then Sprint to Monster. You know, everybody was trying to figure out how to get rid of the word cup. Well, the cup came basically designed. It was the Winston Cup. It's a trophy that has the cup on it. Yeah, because previously it was called a like Grand National. Yeah, it was the Grand, yeah, the, the Na Grand National Series. Yeah. Um, because they didn't, they didn't have a series sponsor. So Bill France with um, Miss Hawkins, she lived over off on Country Club Road. You know, Bowman Gray, being the longest running NASCAR sanctioned track in the United States. So it's kind of cool. It's still here in the back, you know, in the backyard, not really, but in the backyard of Reynolds. And, and they race, you know, the Madhouse. And that racing is that type of racing is what was created through that 33 years. And, and the innovation, by having sponsors, the cars were able to change. You know, you used to be able through the 70s and the 80s, you could have a bad car with a good motor or vice versa, but if you had a good driver, you could overcome it. And then the technology that came into the, to the cars in, in, the, in the late 90s, in, early 2000 was still very creative. You know, you hung the body of the car with the world. So if you put the car on the jack stands, it looked like it was on, on bank, on banking. Now the cars are, you know, they're lasered through inspection. Um, what's going to happen in 2021, uh, it's like that Revell model kit that we all build as a kid. It's going to be whose glue sticks the best. Yeah. I mean, it's the, the innovation's gone. Um, to, you can't ever really say it was cheating. I say it was trying to take the envelope to the fullest and figuring it out. Um, there's a Smoke and Joe car here that was built in Ingle It has the last motor that came out of Ingle that C.V. Rains built, and it was Jimmy Spencer's Speedway car. And if you 
start looking at it, the fuel cells push back, the, the <laughs> front, the front narr <coughs> tread width is narrower. Um, I don't know how Jimmy gets got. Jimmy was your size. I don't even know how he got through the window to get in. A the little seat. Crisco, maybe. Yeah, it, it had to be. <laughs> but those those pieces um, of being able to build cars. Ed Barrier and I raced 299 races together in the truck, the uh, Craftsman series. You know, the, it was Craftsman with the truck, and then uh, the Bush series, and what was the Cup series? And we made our first Cup race. I still have that car in um, '96, Darlington. Yeah, '96, Darlington. We qualified 33rd, and um, it was the first Cup race I'd ever tried to make with Ed. He had made a race in 95. We looked at doing something. He drove a, a Prina dog chow car for another guy. We were going to try to uh, make the race and he was able to drive for him. He had a sponsor. I didn't have a sponsor. But we, you know, Bill Davis is a good friend of mine and, and we made the race and Bill Davis, you know, big old guy. Well, Bill comes up to me and goes, Will, you just can't go gather up a bunch of ball players and go play in the NBA. I said, well, Bill, if you need to put some of your sponsors on a car, I said, I got some room. Yeah. But he was <laughs> he, he was mad, and we you know, we actually we got qualified like Darrell Waltrip and um, a few others, so it was pretty exciting. So I'd like to get a little bit on your involvement. You talked earlier about going to a race at uh, Rockingham, you know, with your dad and stuff. and. It was my friend's dad. Oh, it was your friend's yeah. dad. Okay. So Curtis what, Stevens. Yeah. Was that was that kind of your first involvement in racing, or had you kind of gotten uh, learned about it at a younger age, or at a at a, at a like a more local track than like say around? Nah, I think I think you know we were we went when we went. His dad had a Winnebago, and Gene had a his son, my friend, had a seventy one Mini Trail fifty, and I had a seventy one Mini Trail fifty, and we took them and we camped out in the infield. I still remember it. Had big old 55 gallon drums burning and whatever. And, the, and, and this was the first year of the series and Mr. Stevens had gotten tickets because he worked in manufacturing for Reynolds and he actually ended up retiring. So after that, I, I had, I'd had go-karts prior to that, mini bikes, had the mini trail 50, I was 11 years old. Um, the next step was buying the model cars. Yeah. So I still have all the model cars I built back when I was 11 or 12, 13, I still have them. And it's like a, you know, a Richard Petty car, and a Kale Yarborough car, or whoever. But um, that was kind of like, it, it was I don't know, a motorhead, a gearhead. Yeah, do I like to drive fast? Yeah, do I still go drive? I go to England, to Goodwood. Yeah, it, it was very impressionable. Um, what I saw through the next decade, um, I became a race fan. Um, would go to Bowman Gray um, in the 70s when I was a teenager. Actually, uh, if I say this, the first race I ever raced was a demolition derby at Bowman Gray Stadium. Oh, wow. <laughs> You're lucky your head didn't get so, caved in. <laughs> so so I, I had a, I had a, I had a, um, uh, uh, I think it was like a 73 Mercury that I bought, and and what I remember is, it collapsed all the way to the almost to the back of the driver's seat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you could have been gone. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, you know, at, um, I was trying to think of the announcer that used to announce over there, but uh, so you know, being around it, and then as the '80s came, and you know, I I had a real desire to to, to be a driver, and I met Ed, and and Ed was had been running the Baby Grand Series and had built a car for the Bush Series and, and he was going to race, it was 80, 86 or 7. And I kept thinking, you know, I, I might figure out how to go do this. And um, then I figured out, well, you can't have two drivers in one car. So I let Ed drive and I went out and found sponsorship. Okay, and so you, that, that was kind of your first hit yeah, in the business side of it. Yeah. So, um, with that, as it went, like in ninety, in ninety, in eighty nine, we built a car to go to Daytona for the Bush Series. 
he had his shop at his dad's house and another little shop hit at his house and we built the car from scratch, the chassis, Ed, I mean, and we started in July. And we built this car, we went to Daytona and he made the race. Wow. But those you can never do that nowadays. Those, there's not <laughs> even, there's not even, uh, in all three series now, um, there's less than a half a dozen that can build a car yeah. and go drive it 200 miles an hour. Yeah. And, and, and back in the day, that's what everybody did. Mm -hmm. Wendell Scott, Richard Petty, Lee Petty, everybody, they built, they built their own cars. Started basically with um, um, a factory stock car and converted it to a race car. Souped it up and stuff. Yeah. Did you have a favorite driver back then? Um, or maybe it's just some yeah, favorites well, in general? No, I, I, you know, I have to say that um, Richard Petty was probably the, um, and that probably came from Mr. Stevens. He was a big Petty fan and, and watching, you know, Richard was so personable to everyone. You know, he's the last man standing to sign an autograph. I mean, uh, he, that's why he became the king. And um, I get to see him a couple times a year. And um, he's a fascinating, his memory um, is, is incredible. Um, we were over in England this past year and he was talking to Al Unser. And I believe it was Al Unser. And um, they were talking about different races and I was sitting there and he's talking about the last turn and, and I asked him about he had a Buick and he was talking about where he finished with this Buick. He could he he can remember everything, which is amazing. Yeah. It's crazy. It's fun to listen to him. You'd think he'd get away with forgetting a few things, but no, you know. <laughs> no. And I think I think that's you know, my my mother's <clears throat> gonna be ninety two and I and, and she she works at a consignment shop and done it for 40 years and I think that's what keeps them young they stay busy they've got something to do every day um, uh, Richard just like Richard Childers I mean he's he's got his grandkids and he's you know Mike Dillon's a good friend of mine and, and just watching the, the transition of family within the sport and it was that was a big part of it it was it was a family sport it's a generational sport um, it may be more generational in the driver owner than it is now as far as the the, the fan base. I, I don't even say that the, the older generation still has the, the passion. The younger generations coming up don't really understand it was a family sport. So, and you, just like a football team, you, you picked your driver and you had your second driver. And, um, I mean, I, I remember uh, and I was talking about this last week. I remember being in Atlanta, and um, Alan Kowicki had to lead the most laps, and he beat Bill Elliott by one point and won the championship. Yeah. And he came out of nowhere, and he was an engineer. And Alan, his engineering ability being able to build a car and drive it, which was very similar to, to most of the drivers at the time, had built their cars and drove it in the lower series up. Maybe not so if they were driving for for Junior Johnson or uh, Bud Moore or the Wood Brothers, but um, they had the knowledge. And now that knowledge, you know, it's kind of like it's, if you look at where I think it's going to be in 2021. It's kind of like when the IROC series. Yeah. You know, you you drew, drew a straw and you got a car. Yeah, it was kind of yeah. see who can who yeah. can draft up yeah. here and get it. Yeah. You know what? Uh, what kind of got me? You're talking about uh, you know having all these cars through your work with JK, JKS, and now that I kind of jog my memory back a little bit, because the way I was as a race fan as a kid, I was going to I, I grew up in Burlington, so A Speedway and Elon was kind of my home track for Friday nights. Been there, and I would remember kind of show cars coming out there and all the souvenirs and stuff, and. I didn't get to go to a lot of cup races until I was kind of 12 and 14 because no one wanted to take a kid younger than 10 to a 500 mile race. Right. <laughs> so Long probably day. a lot of those cars that I saw early on that were to me as a kid, oh, that's the cup car was because of all the cars y'all were doing at JKS <laughs> to, to do stuff like yeah. that. And it was like, oh man, I could touch it. You know, I, I couldn't get a pit pass as a kid to a cup race, but I could go to Ace or Orange County or if they did like a sponsor thing or something and see like a JKS car and 
that that was real to me you know yeah and i think the thing that you know reynolds started out with the glass car what we call and then uh, in 71 then by 73 they you know they had a dodge coronet and, uh, or a charger i want to call it a charger and um, a couple other cars that, you know whether different manufacturers and they supported the manufacturers whether we built a you know if it was a chrysler product or a ford or a gm product and the the next they the teams didn't have show cars so the cars that they sh would show uh, were actually race cars so it might have been a speedway car or something that they weren't going to use and uh, at that particular time um, the the growth of that, uh, the second show car program we ever had was Goody's Headache Powders, which w is actually the Dodge Daytona that's sitting behind us. It's a 71 Dodge Daytona. It was Dave Marcus's super speedway car and it was built by Petty. Um, it has a 426 Hemi, it runs. Um, but it was the Goody show car for, for a decade. Wow. And when it had been mothballed, um, it was in the warehouse. And when I was trying to figure out how to end the the 33 years, the, the idea was I went to Reynolds, I said, take this 70, it raced in 71, take this 71 Dodge Daytona, it was just blue, we'll redo it, do a Winston Cup paint scheme on it, and get Richard Petty to drive it at Miami for the last race, and the, there's yeah. a picture of him driving it there, and uh, it was, um, it was a bittersweet day. The one thing I remember about that day was when the 43 car field started up and we started the 71 with the Hemi in it, yeah. you could hear it over the 43 cars. Wow. It was that much louder. It was that much louder. <laughs> and um, it was, you know, it was, it was a, it was a great day. And um, Reynolds, again, um, was very committed to the sport. The teams were committed to the sport. NASCAR at the time was committed to the sport. Um, it was a family sport. It was accessible on TV. There was creativity uh, and camaraderie among the teams. Um, and, you know, before Reynolds got into it, they were running 60 race in the Grand National Series. They were running 60 races a year. All over weekend. the place. Yeah, yeah. All over the place, twice a weekend. So, like Wendell Scott's car here in the museum is a 71 Mercury Cyclone that was wrecked in the Winston 500 in 1973 because uh, Jim France wanted to start, Bill France wanted to start, Senior wanted to start uh, 60 cars and they had a big pile up in the first 20 laps and it took out 18 cars and the car that Wendell had, you know, Wendell's career uh, was very colorful compared to, to, to Junior Johnson's. Um, he started as a, a moonshiner in Virginia and got a job because a track promoter went to the Virginia Highway Patrol and said, who's the best moonshiner in the state of Virginia? They said, Wendell Scott. And they said, why is that? He said, we've never caught him. <laughs> and, and Wendell ran 500 races. Uh, he had the Wood Brothers helped him, uh, Bud Moore, every, everybody helped him. And he bought this car from uh, a gentleman named James Hammer Mason. They built the lightweights for Ford Motor Company. That guy sounded like he should have been in boxing, not yeah. in racing. Yeah, James Hammer. Hammer Mason. <laughs> and his, his company was called Dearborn Steel and Tubing. And um, Kelly Arbor and a couple other drivers drove that car. But Wendell ended up with that car. And Wendell built his own motors in his garage. And he was, uh, my understanding, was having a hard time getting the car up to speed. So he, lo he was loaned a mo motor from the Wood Brothers. Um, he made the race and had the wreck. And, the cars as it was wrecked in 1973 and somebody says well, why don't you restore it and I said well, why would you restore the Titanic yeah you know it's a piece of history but all the cars um, they they're there's 40 some cars that are related to the museum we've loaned them to the Guggenheim I loaned them to Darlington I loaned them to Talladega we keep about 20 some cars in the museum at all all times and we change them up so I have a I have a 43 Richard Petty car that's not in here right now, a 42 Kyle Petty Silver Bullet Sabco car. So pretty much the teams, uh, all the teams that were represented th through those three decades um, that were 
you know, running every week, uh, whether it was Junie Donlevy out of Richmond or uh, Bill Elliott out of um, Dawsonville, Georgia, there's a car that represents the periods. Yeah. Because of how involved you were on, on, on your end of the business, you know, Winston sponsorship of the series comes to a close there in the early 2000s. Did you have any kind of indicator some years out that it was kind of coming or did it kind of come all of a sudden that this thing's going to come to an end and let's wrap it up and finish as strong as we yeah. can? We knew just like the, the, the Winston Racing Series changed because or pretty much kind of there were a couple of factors with it. I mean uh, NASCAR had changed the the age limit to, to race in the series, um, the, the the progression of the tobacco industry and the way they had to market had changed. The master settlement agreement um, calls you know calls them more limitations. Um, we did the Winston, and then we did the Winston Million. You yeah. know that was a great program, and then we did the Noble Five. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, but the cars had the orange numbers on them. And yeah. Stuff. So we, you know, we 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 were able, to, like JKS, to to be able to support all those programs. The Noble Five was a you know a fan and a driver, pretty much. And if they won, they each got a million dollars. And I think it was, uh, if I remember correctly, we did five years of it. And of the five years, I I, I think it was about a dozen. Times that the Noble Five was won, yeah, by a driver, which was really cool. I mean, um, uh, I was at Darlington uh, doing the Winston Million, and Dale Jarrett uh, unfortunately got into the wall. He'd won two of the races. If he'd won that one, he would have won the million dollars. Um, and unfortunately, the car that got accused of putting the oil on the track that caused him to go in the wall was my car. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I have the bottle that he didn't get in, in my office, um, but uh, it wasn't us. It was Brett Bodine. There we go. And Brett Bodine had bought the team from Junior, and a good friend of mine, Harold Day, that owns David E. Day, was one of the NASCAR officials, and we were able to figure out the timing or whatever. But it was, you know, he, it was kind of like. And my my thing was when everybody was upset at me at. The, I was Robert Yates or racing uh, the the piece. I said, "Well, I say I saved Reynolds three quarters of a million dollars. I don't know what anybody's upset about." <laughs> <laughs> that was my that was the only comeback I had. That's a pretty good one, though. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I got a quarter of a million dollars because yeah. Reynolds Reynolds didn't you know the thing at Reynolds they didn't they didn't insure it they didn't yeah. do like Lords of London. I mean, it was a fair deal. They they weren't gambling. They and they wanted the drivers to win. Yeah, they, it's more they, public. I mean, it's they, more they wanted, something to talk about. Yeah. You know, and uh, I had a sponsor. I'll tell you how crazy it is, sponsors and getting sponsors in. And uh, '92, uh, Speedway Scene wrote this story that uh, Three Star Motorsports, which is the name of my race team, Ed and I, and his dad, um, said that we should get uh, three should get an award for the most sponsors in any given year in NASCAR. Yeah, because I'd have a primary, but I always told Ed by Saturday, I said, I'll have something for the hood. And I just kept digging, digging, digging. And, and we were able to pay our way. And, and we did it for, we we did it for, God, two decades doing, you know, and not knowing if you were going to have the sponsorship. But it changed, and it has changed. And, I mean, where you, you used to be able to go and race on a cup car in the 80s, for less than three million, they want twenty-five million a day, and they're, and they're not even getting fifteen million now. I remember Mark Martin. Uh, he was talking on his podcast. I think uh, he was talking about in nineteen eighty-nine, Rusty Wallace, who would end up being the champion, was Blue Max just, Racing, Rain yeah, and Beal. Yeah, he was ecstatic because he was like, "Man, I got you know, I got a million dollar sponsorship, you know, for the year," and Mark was like. Yeah, nowadays that'll buy you about three races. Yeah, you know it just got so expensive. It's three, it's three hundred and seventy-five to, depending on the team, it's three seventy-five to five hundred thousand dollars a race, which is crazy. Yeah. I mean, I think even if you took Hendricks would when Junior was still driving, you know, uh, I did the support piece for Nationwide uh, 
for a, for a decade. I did three years prior to them becoming the series sponsor um, for the Bush series. You know, it kind of Bush left, then it was nationwide. Uh, and then I did Xfinity. So I was able to, you know, the truck series was, you know, Craftsman. Um, so I, I uh, kind of like the f first couple of decades, uh, the transition was there and then at the end. So Reynolds, to, I guess, to get back to the question, it, I knew in 2001, I definitely knew in 2002 when the drag racing series um, was being ended and, and I knew relatively pretty much toward the end of two that, that three was it. Yeah. And we had to figure it out, but they, uh, it was, they were spending 35 million a year. And then they were spending another 50 plus million supporting it, the series sponsorship. Wow. And when Nextel came in, Nextel gave NASCAR 70 million a year. And I'll never forget, I, they wanted to know, we were on a call about all the signage at the tracks and they said, well, how do we decide about the track signage, et cetera, da, 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 da. And I said, well, it's just basically what you want to pay for. And they go, what do you mean, pay for? The 70 million a year doesn't give us any signage. I said, no, that's just the rights to the series. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we ended up to convert the tracks. In 2004, it was, uh, it was almost $2 million to change the signage at all the tracks. No one thinks about that. Everybody yeah. just sees a sign. Yeah, <laughs> but it was it was a two million dollar changeover, you know, and knowing that we were limited on time, and uh, um, as I've told a lot of people that wanted to do internships and things, I've I've missed more planned meals than you've had. Yeah, but because of being in NASCAR, and if you think it's glory, it's not. And we, we would always find out that by the tenth race. You were either a, you were either dedicated and and you you know you could, you could make it a whole season, but most people that went to work in NASCAR after about ten races, you'd never see them again. Just it, fell out. The it, attrition it, rate would get it, it was it was unreal. And the same, not so much for the teams and the drivers because they were competitors. And if you know, luckily I was a competitor, not a race fan. Um, I've never asked a driver for an autograph, and I've been with all of them. That they did sign the, the car there, the Superbird, yeah. the, the, the Daytona, and uh, we did a deal for Noble Five down in Tal Talladega, this place, Selwood Farms. It was a skeet shooting contest, and actually Mark Sharon, that works for me, has been with me for two decades. We won the, the, the skeet shooting contest, and I, was, I had my acrylic trophy. And, Richard Childress said, hey, let me sign that. And I said, no, you're going to ruin my trophy. Leave it alone. <laughs> and he pulls out a sharp and he signs it. And the next thing I know, Dale signs it. Mark Martin signs it. And the other two that were in the Noble Five deal was kind of funny. And I, I don't have a lot of racing paraphernalia, but I have that at home because I told him, I stood there and looked at him and said, guys, y'all ruined my trophy. Yeah, I didn't want you, John. I didn't want it. This. I didn't want it. But, um, you know, it, for me, um, to, to do – both aspects of it, take the history, um, create the museum, which we opened in May of 2005. So it's been here a decade and a half, which is phenomenal. Um, I do credit Richard Childress when I uh, said, what do I do with all this stuff? And he says, well, you don't have a choice but open a museum. Yeah. <laughs> and after we lost Dale, I was able to restore 80% of the cars that are at RCR the noble, you know, the ones from the Noble Five programs to the, all the w different times that uh, uh, Dale, you know, won a championship. You know, the, the bottles, the Noble Five, all those banners, all the things. If you go to RCR, are things that were produced at JKS for the teams, and you know, all the other teams. Hendricks has got things. You know, uh, Roush. All of them have products that were produced because of uh, Winston, yeah. what JKS did, and now we're able to preserve it in museums like the Winston Cup Museum. Well, I'll tell you, the one thing I've learned the most about Winston sponsorship that I didn't, maybe didn't realize at the time, but I realize now, Winston red paint 
takes a long time to fade away. Because North Wilkesboro sitting in its state, I think its last race was 96, because I, I got to go to that last race. That red paint, it might be faded, but you can still tell what it yeah. says. Y'all picked a good color. So, so Dan Henley that was over the Winston Racing Series, he'd order, we'd have to, we'd order paint at the end, at the end of the year for the following year, because it usually had to burn up budgets is what I'd call it. And we'd get pallets of five gallon buckets of red paint. And then we would ship every track the quantity of paint. We had a master list. Then yeah. we'd ship it to them. And then what, how it worked for like the, the cup series to the racing series, everything, because Reynolds was always re innovating what they were going to give away or whatever. All of the leftover, not to say leftover, but the things that we had for the cup series, we would put together for the individual Winston Racing Series tracks for their banquets. So we would send, you know, ashtrays, lighters, premiums, all these different things for them to be able to, to, to have to do a banquet. You know, if it was yeah. cups and flags, um, we produced all the flags for the tracks. And from that doing what we did for rentals for the tracks, then the tracks would have JKS do stuff. So it was, it was a win, it was a win-win uh, situation. Gotcha. Well, I appreciate you taking time. No. And, uh, I, I love learning about this stuff, man. This is it's, this is a lot of this stuff is so not to make you sound old. I don't uh, I don't mean that, but it's, it's so much that was just before my time that I love learning and stuff. So I, I really, think I really appreciate what you're doing. I think there are things that we find here at the museum, and I look for things that were produced by rentals, not one-offs, or things that were done for different promotions or had the rights. But rentals, you know, in the just want to say this, innovative creative, their sports marketing team uh, was the best there was. And a lot of those guys are now retiring. Grant Lynch just retired from Talladega. Um, a lot of them moved on to, to racetracks after, the, after 2003. So it's, it's neat to see there's a cart back there that has an, everybody's name that worked at sports marketing over that 33 years. And um, uh, we lose a few of them every now and then. But it's it's been a good, it was good. Um, maybe one day um, you'll, from this podcast, if the people that are listening will come to the museum, we do, it's an event center, we do birthday parties, we've done weddings, we, we can do anything you want. We've you've done, done weddings here. Yeah. Well, we did, excuse me, we did. If that ain't we American, did somebody, I don't no, know they what renewed is. their vows here. Oh, okay, okay. They renewed their vows here, but we would do a wedding here. Um, okay. So if that ain't American, I don't know what it is. Yeah, so, but there are people, if you read the book, and I want to say you read the guest book, um, most of what they say is thank you for preserving that 33 years. 